Hello, my name is Shoham Adesis, and today I'll be reviewing the Adesis Conceptual Map. This map provides a total overview of the entire Adesis methodology. So as you're learning the Adesis methodology, you should identify where you are within the context of this map. So every word and arrow and symbol on this map has a meaning. And you could expand on any one of these terms and find a chapter in a book or one of the top leaf videos that explains just one arrow. For example, we have a video called Accelerated Change, which talks about why there is change and why it's accelerating. There's another video about why change causes problems and opportunities. There's even a video for this arrow right here called Secret of Success. So every symbol on this map expands into a whole other section of knowledge, and this provides the overview. So once again, what we're doing today is just taking a look at this big picture so that as you go on and study the methodology, you can always refer back and identify where what you're doing and what it has to do within the greater context of the Jesus methodology. So let's get started. It starts with change, and change causes problems and opportunities that we have to manage. But in managing change, we actually create more change, which creates more problems and opportunities that we have to manage, that we have to change and so on. This is called the change loop. Well, you might ask if there's a change loop and whatever I do will create new problems that I'll have to manage, which will create new problems. So how do I win? How do I know that I am managing well? And the answer comes in the form of a joke. Two guys are walking in Africa on a walking safari and they come across a lion and they can see by the way the lion gets up that it's going to chase them. So one of the friends drops to his knees and starts putting on his running shoes. The other guy looks at him and says, hey, what are you doing? You can't outrun a lion. And he says, I don't have to outrun the lion. I only have to outrun you. Just like you cannot outrun a lion, you cannot outrun change. All you can do is put on your running shoes. What does it mean to put on your running shoes as an organization? It means we have to proactively identify and address our problems and opportunities and manage them by creating more change faster than the competition. The competition which is subject to the same rate of change that we are. We just have to outrun them. One way we can traverse this loop faster is by knowing the road ahead. If we can predict what problems we will face in the future, we can more proactively speed up this process of adapting to them, of managing those problems. There are certain change that's external in nature, and we can't really predict that. That's really what analysts do. But there are other problems that are developmental in nature. Just like you can read a book about what to expect when you're expecting and what the terrible twos are like in the teenage years, the same thing for organizations. Organizations grow, age, and die similarly to other living organisms. So that's where the life cycle theory comes in. It comes into this change loop right here. By knowing the life cycle, we can traverse this loop faster. Now, in order to manage, we must do two things. One is decide, but deciding is not enough. We must also implement. A great decision never implemented is worthless. You must decide and implement. What we identify is that the system we need in order to make good decisions is an open system, a system where if you disagree with me, I would ask you to please speak up. Tell me why you disagree with me so I can learn from you and make a better decision. On the other hand, the system we need in order to implement good decisions or implement decisions is a closed system, a system where if you disagree with me, I'm going to tell you to shut up. Here, I need you to speak up. Here, I need you to shut up. This we call a democratic system, an open system, a freedom of the press system where everybody has a say. Democracy as theoretically should be applied. On this system here, we need a dictatorship. We need do what I tell you to do and shut up and do it and no disagreement. Do you see the conflict between the two systems we need 
in order for us to manage. We need both an open system, a democratic system, and a closed dictatorial system. The conflict between these two systems is known as democracy. That's the word we use for this conflict. Other conflicts that exist in management is the conflict over what is a good decision. Different people have different interpretations of what really makes for a best decision. They have different interpretations because they have different strengths and necessarily they have different styles. And by the way, we want this. If two people think the same, one is unnecessary. We want different styles in order to make good decisions. But people with different styles have conflicts. I think we all know about these kinds of personal conflicts. Another conflict that exists over on this side of the map is the conflict of implementation. Why? Because if you need more than one person cooperation, if you need more than one person's cooperation to implement a decision, well, different people, by definition, have different interests. And this concept of a win-win and how we can always find a win-win is really a utopian expectation. In the short run, whenever you create change, somebody wins and somebody loses. In the long run, you can find a common win-win, but only in the long run. For the here and now, it's typically a win-lose situation. Only in the long run will the organization do better and then everybody can win. So that is what's happening. There is change, which we have to manage, but in management, there is conflict. So far, we identified three sources of conflict. Democracy, conflict of styles, and conflict of interests. There are actually seven different sources of conflict. I'm not going to go into them right now. I'll just stick with the basic three. Um, that will be a subject for a different video. Now conflict. This conflict can either be destructive or constructive. Notice the imagery here. This is an open highway. It's an open highway because if you do nothing with conflict, it will become destructive. If you want to make it constructive, you have to do something. Why? Well, it's just like if you're a farmer. If you do nothing with your fields, you'll get weeds. If you want fruits and vegetables and flowers, you have to garden. You have to do something. That's just the way God made the world. Now, what must you do in order to make this conflict constructive? You must create a culture of mutual trust and respect. We need respect because respect makes this conflict constructive. If we respect each other, we will listen to each other. And we will listen to our, from our different points of view and different opinions. We will learn from each other and we will make a better decision. That is only if we respect each other. On the other hand, when it comes time to implementation, we don't need respect. We need trust. Why? Because there's no win-win right here and now. When will the win-win come? In the long run. So we must trust that while right now, the decision that was made, the decision that you're asking us to implement, we must trust that while right now it doesn't meet our short-term interests, we trust that in the long run, it'll wash out. Our common interests will be met. This time I win, you lose. Next time you lose, I win. But in the long run, I trust that we both win. So we need mutual trust and respect to make that conflict constructive. If it becomes destructive, then the actual change loop doesn't start here. It starts here. Destructive conflict will make for change in the wrong direction and will end up with bigger problems we can't handle will fall apart. If the change loop comes from here, constructive conflict will end up with a change that will make us stronger as an organization and able to deal with bigger problems. So that's what we want a culture of mutual trust and respect. And this is nothing new. This is united we stand, divided we fall. And if we're divided, we're going to end up with destructive conflict. If we're united, we'll end up with constructive conflict. So we call this the secret of success of any organization. It's the culture. But how do we create that culture? Just talking about trust and respect is not going to do it. That's what we want. What should we do to make it a reality? 
What we should do, you can think of as an analogy with baking an apple pie. Creating an organizational culture of mutual trust and respect is like baking an apple pie. The first thing you need when you're baking an apple pie is good ingredients. In an organization, your ingredients are your people. If one bad apple can ruin an apple pie, well then one bad person can ruin an organizational culture. What's a bad person? A bad person is someone who can't be trusted, can't be respected, and doesn't trust others and doesn't respect others. That's someone who's going to ruin your organizational culture. But let's assume we have good people, good apples, but our recipe is no good and we end up using too much salt or too much sugar. That can also ruin the organization, our apple pie. And if we don't have a good collaborative process, managerial process, the managerial process is the process that defines how do we go about identifying and addressing the problems and opportunities that come from change. How do we make decisions and implement those decisions? That's the managerial process. If that process is broken, let's say we sweep all our problems under the rug. Well, then when those problems become crises, everybody's going to start blaming each other for the problems, and that's not good for trust and respect. Maybe we all get together and have meetings and talk about our problems, but blame each other for the problems and point fingers. That's also not good for trust and respect. What we need, what we need is a managerial process that helps us deal with all seven sources of conflict and make them constructive. That's a good managerial process. Let's say we have a good process. Let's say we have good ingredients and a good recipe, but we put our apple pie in an oven that's broken. It's meant to be at 400 degrees, but the dial is broken. It's actually at 500 degrees. What's going to happen to our apple pie? It's going to get burnt. And that happens in many organizations. They have good people and a good process, but their structure is broken. What is the structure of the organization? The structure of the organization defines who is responsible for what, but it also defines who has authority for what, who can spend what money, who can tell what people what to do, who can hire, who can fire, who can sign what contracts, who can use what capital resources. This is all part of the structure. The third part of the structure is what do we get rewarded for? What do you get paid for? What is your bonus structure based on? What is your salary on? All of this is part of the structure. If you are responsible for getting one thing done, but you don't have the authority to get it done, you simply don't have the keys to make it happen, but you get paid on salary anyway. Very soon, that individual will stop doing their job. Why? Well, I can't do my job, but I get paid anyway, so why not just sit down and retire on the job? That's called getting burnt. And what happens to trust and respect when we see people that are burnt out on the job? They're not doing anything. Well, we lose trust for them. We lose respect for them. And we lose trust and respect for our organization. Further along here in structure, and by the way, like everything on this map, there's you know endless lectures on this. I'll give you the highlights. Further on structure is we want good fences that make good neighbors. If I don't know where my job ends and your job begins, then you're always stepping on my toes trying to do my job. We're kind of competing internally. Further, we want transparent fences. I want to know what you're doing. I want to know, how, you know, I typically we know how much authority somebody has, but we don't know what their responsibility is. So by creating transparency in their responsibility and their authority, it cleans up a lot of the mess that happens in many organizations. Further, I'll go into one more, is that you want to maintain control of the organization. If you structure an organization incorrectly, Top management loses control over short-term versus long-term goals or efficiency or effectiveness. The orientation, who's at the wheel of the organization? If you structure it incorrectly, you no longer have your hand on the wheel. And what happens to trust and respect when the founder feels like they lost control of their organization? Well, they come running in and start micromanaging because they feel like they've lost control. And now 
that kills trust and respect. Micromanagement. Okay, finally, we're making an apple pie. We have great apples, great ingredients, a great recipe, a wonderful oven, works perfectly. But in your head, you believe we are making this apple pie for the Queen of England. In my head, I believe we're making it for a fast food chain. When our apple pie falls in the ground, I'm going to blow it off, put it in a cardboard box, and ask for the next customer, right? You, on the other hand, will want to start all over again. You'll want a brand new apple pie and cardboard box. Forget about it. You're going to want a gold plate with flowers and ice cream. Why? You're making it for the Queen of England. I'm making it for a fast food chain. We have different visions, mission, and value. We're driving in different directions. We're doing our apple pie. We're making it for different purposes. And we'll end up having a big fight over that, which will hurt trust and respect. So what are we saying? We're saying that in order to change the culture of an organization, it's not enough to change the people. It's not enough to change the process. It's not enough to change the structure. You have to change all four of these holistically and in the right sequence. Where Adesis stands out, how we're different from other management methodologies, is nearly all other management methodologies, at least 90% of them, all deal with people. Look at any management textbook. They're teaching you how to be a better manager. And sure, we can try and make our managers better, but changing people is very difficult. In fact, we believe that it is often easier to change a person's environment and watch them change than to try and change people and expect them to change their environment. After all, people are a product of their environment. So let's review. There is change and we must manage. There is a need to manage that change. In order to manage that change, there is, we will need to, there is conflict. In management, there is conflict. We want to make that conflict constructive rather than destructive by having a culture of mutual trust and respect. And in order to create that culture of mutual trust and respect, we should Deal with people, process, structure, mission, vision, and values holistically and in the right sequence. That is the Adesis conceptual map. As you're learning more about the specific subjects, PAI, CAPI, or you know the Adesis program for organizational transformation, the secret of success, perceptions of reality, the life cycle, pay attention to not only the details of what you're learning, but also pay attention to how that fits into the bigger picture of the Adesis methodology. I hope that helps accelerate your studies and thank you for viewing this video.